Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Chen and I am the editor of the newsletter at ANA. As part of the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month in the United States, we bring to you a series of five interviews and conversations with notable scholars and leaders in our field today, which was inspired by similar work from our colleagues at the Society for Black Neuropsychology. Our fifth guest is Dr. Sandra Liu. Dr. Liu is a professor of psychiatry and director of pediatric neuropsychology training and pediatric neuromodulation at UCLA. Her research focuses on gene brain behavior pathways in childhood neurodevelopmental disorders, such as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, chronic tic disorders, and obsessive compulsive disorders. She's also focused on improving treatments for these conditions, specifically by using non-invasive neuromodulation treatments in remediating cognitive dysfunction. Dr. Liu's teaching and clinical activities are focused on comprehensive neuropsychological assessments of youth with pediatric and psychiatric conditions. And speaking to Dr. Liu today is Dr. Alexander Tan. Dr. Tan is a pediatric neuropsychologist at Children's Hospital of Orange County, where he co-directs the Cardiac Neurodevelopmental Clinic. He received his PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Texas Southwestern. Dr. Tan currently serves on the Society for Clinical Neuropsychology's Education Advisory Committee and is a co-founder of No Neuropsychology. He's also the member at large at ANA. You can read more about Dr. Tan and other members of ANA on our website at the-ana.org. So please check those out. Our association will not be what it is today without the direction and support of those of you in our community. So as such, we welcome and invite your comments, suggestions, and any insights you may have for our guests and our media team. These also include possible future projects and collaborations. You can bring these to our attention via email at the.ana.newsletter at gmail.com, or you can tweet us at, at Asian Neuropsych. Finally, if you enjoyed this video, please check out our other videos on our YouTube page and support us by liking and subscribing. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Liu, for taking the time to be with us. Um, personally, being, yeah, personally being an early career Chinese um, pediatric neuropsychologist practicing in California. <laughs> <laughs> so excited to be able to speak with a role model that is uh, relevant in so many ways to my both professional and, and personal identity. So. Um, maybe to start off, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, including um, how you identify culturally and what led you to the field of neuropsychology and to specialize in pediatric neuropsychology? Sure. So um, I identify as Chinese American. Um, I, my, my mom and dad are immigrated from, my dad came from the Kowloon side of Hong Kong and my mom, and when he was a teenager, my mom came um, from Taiwan. Uh, for graduate school. And, you know, my dad, when he came, he was, he was a 13, 14 year old paper brother. So in order to be able to come here, he took the last name of his cousin, who was his brother on paper. And so, um, and kept that name. And so my family name is actually my middle name. And my last name is my dad's cousin's last name. Um, and so I, you know, I was brought up in a pretty traditional Chinese household, although, you know, this was the seventies, my mom and dad wanted me to speak perfect English. Um, they didn't want me to speak Chinese and they didn't want me to speak with a Chinese accent. So I was never formally taught Chinese, um, until they tried and Chinese school. <laughs> that didn't work out so well. So I, you know, I was definitely brought up in, in primarily, predominantly Caucasian communities. I was teased, called names for sure. And, um, you know, that's the California experience, actually. And, uh, but I did, so I assimilated to survive. Um, and it wasn't until I went away to college when I went to Berkeley, where there was a larger Asian um, American community there, and then went to graduate school in Hawaii, that I started to become uh, more interested, more aware in my, my cultural background. I mean, things that I had grown up with, but more willing to share with my social group about the fact that I had um, lived that experience. And it was really in Hawaii, which was a very 
fascinating experience because, you know, there's such a large Asian American community. It's, it's the majority population there, of course. And, and um, so I became much more interested and aware of equity, diversity, and inclusion issues, um, systematic racism and um, institutional oppression. Um, and so that's kind of set the stage for um, this piece of my career. And then I have just always loved the brain. I always knew I would be doing something with the brain. Um, my path as a neuropsychologist has definitely been non-traditional. So I was, um, there was no neuropsychology training in Hawaii. And so I had a generalist child clinical uh, psychology uh, training. And then when I went to internship and then postdoc, um, in my postdoc, I started doing more training in neuropsych uh, testing. And I was already uh, a behavioral neuroscience and had a pretty strong nurse neuroscience background. So I kind of coupled those together. The, um, the additional training in neuropsych testing with my neuroscience background to um, understand brain behavior relationships, both in my clinical work as well as my research. Wow. It's um, so great to hear, you know, kind of your, your background and, and how you got to where you are and um, something that you, you touched on that I kind of want to explore here. Um, you know, when I was interviewing for graduate programs uh, and even throughout my training, it was so rare to see fellow Asians in the field of especially pediatric neuropsychology. Yes. And even as an example, during one of my graduate school interviews, uh, a faculty member walked up to me and said, uh, an Asian male, I'm so surprised to see you here. You know, um, a comment like that. Yeah. And I've since become aware that there are significant um, diversity pipeline issues that our field faces. Uh, you know, that was during our, uh, my interview phase. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just wondering uh, what your thoughts are on how we can improve the diversity pipeline issues that our specialty faces. And it sounds like you navigated. Yeah, I've thought a lot about it. And, you know, I think what's interesting is that in healthcare, and then the larger setting, of course, is academic medicine. And, but even at the university level, um, you know, this whole myth of the Asian American model minority has, has worked, as, worked against us in so many ways. Um, it's interesting because, you know, you have to have a more nuanced perspective um, I think always, but particularly in the case of Asian Americans. So I think that, um, you know, if you look at healthcare um, in general, Asian Americans don't appear to be underrepresented. We don't, we are not grouped together with the other URMs, under, you know, underrepresented minority groups, um, which typically includes African Americans. Latino and um, and uh, American Native American populations, but there's a it's a gradient. So what ends up happening is that Asian Americans are um, represented in healthcare um, and academic academic medicine. However, what happens is that we you know we end up being the hard workers who never um, climb the ladder. And so when you get to more senior faculty positions like professors, um, then our numbers are very low, very, very low. And so, and then if you go even higher than that, so if you think about um, deans and you know, administration at the university level, it's even worse. And that's actually just a reflection or a microcosm of um, industry in general in America. So if you think about other um, professions, other areas that were, you know, kind of well represented at the bottom, such as technology, the, the likelihood of an Asian American moving into a leadership position is incredibly low and lower, less likely than an African American, for example. So I think what that means is that as, you know, and it's not that we don't have some people some leaders, but they're, but they're very few. And we are certainly underrepresented in academic medicine. 
and in leadership positions across, I think, most areas. And so I think that's, you know, that's a call for younger people like you and people like me that, um, you know, we, we need to um, aspire to working our way up the ladder and we need to um, think about positions of leadership and we need to apply, we need to put ourselves out there for positions of leadership. Um, because I think as Dr. Sue said in his interview, you know, there's, there's this coming big change in demographic and who knows exactly how that's going to go. But, you know, certainly we would want people in places of lead, or Asian Americans in places of leadership to help navigate that change in demographic. And so, you know, I think that means a lot in terms of, start, you know, early career people kind of thinking consciously about what that means for them. And, you know, I mean, I, it was not easy moving my way up the ladder. I kicked and clawed and just tried to survive. Um, but so at whatever place you feel ready and able to think about leadership in your respective area, I think it's really important. Um, I think when you're thinking about a job, you might want to look at the institution and understand the structure vis-a-vis -vis psychologists, as well as in terms of racial equity, diversity, and inclusion, to see if this is the place where you can progress, you know, to evaluate that from the get-go. And to think about that as your path, rather than just kind of, um, you know, trying to fit in, trying to do your good work. And I mean, that's all important, but kind of thinking in the bigger picture. And so I've been trying to do that um, ever. And, and I'll be honest, I mean, again, it, it's not been easy. Um, I definitely have worked um, and wondered, didn't know if I would make it all the way through. But I will say when I made professor, I felt like, oof, finally I can now work more, put more effort into helping my other people too. I mean, I've always done my, you know, worked with my postdocs and my trainees, but kind of a, on a wider, more systemic scale. And so I'm starting to incorporate that into the opportunities that I look at, the things, the way that I look at certain things, so. Yeah, that's so helpful to realize that just a difference in perspective can mean so much um, and to see how much you've achieved, uh, but even from very early on, really being thoughtful about how you progress and how you advance. Um, that's very helpful uh, for me as well um, to hear. Um, you know, so it, many, many clinical neuropsychologists are working in academic medi uh, medical settings and um, mm -hmm. uh, you kind of started touching on um, some of the issues that you've seen as you've, as you've uh, been in that setting. Um, could you speak a little more on what kind of equity, diversity, and inclusion issues that you're seeing today in academic medicine? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I mean, I'm a very data-driven person. So I think one of the things that's important is to, to understand your particular setting, to know what the numbers are in terms of, um, um, you know, Asian Americans, in terms of other underrepresented minorities, in terms of um, you know, junior versus senior faculty and leadership, because without knowing what your situation is, it's, it's hard to start having that dialogue. But, you know, at UCLA, I am, I now know those numbers. Um, and I know that we are, we are extremely underrepresented. Women and uh, URMs are extremely underrepresented. And actually, Asians, again, are not considered a URM. But, you know, there are systematic efforts at this point, anti-racism, EDI initiatives, and, you know, Asians, again, are systematically left out of those resources, of those opportunities. And I think, um, so, A, having information and knowing what the data tell you about your place. B, then being able to speak up and be able, being able to say, hey, this is, there's, there is an, an inequity here. And, um, it, it just means, it doesn't mean 
everyone shouldn't benefit. I mean, that, you know, these other groups shouldn't benefit, but, you know, broaden your definition a little so that truly other groups of people that need assistance, that need resources, that need opportunities will also receive them. And that, you know, in terms of Asian Americans. So that's what I've been trying to do more, um, you know, is to talk with leadership, talk with the people that I know that, you know, that can um, think about it, that can help with, you know, instituting some policies. I think that's a really important, um, because I just don't think, I think it's just invisible. And, you know, especially in academic medicine and hospitals, everyone loves to think that it's so equitable because we're all, we all tend to be pretty liberal. And, um, you know, I mean, I would say the same in terms of the uh, stratification of MDs and PhDs. It's kind of one of those things where, you know, most hospitals, most MDs feel like PhDs are treated on par. Um, and, you know, you have to look closer at the structure and, and what's actually happening to determine whether that's true or not. There's a whole range. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, again, academic medicine as a microcosm of the university, as a microcosm of, of our larger, you know, culture, I think a lot of the same things are happening. I just don't think people are aware. You yeah. this is such, you know, helpful insight. And as you were speaking, I noticed that there's, uh, just as I was listening, I, I noticed that along this progression, um, there's so many barriers along the way. So you, you mentioned, um, you know, being aware. And then there's this jump from being aware to actually speaking out, you know, mm -hmm. and there's so many barriers right there. And then from speaking out to actually making some kind of change, even on an institutional level, and there's so many barriers there as well. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could speak a little on your experience navigating those specific, you know, jumps um, from step to step. Yeah, you know, I think, I think allies um, are key. And I think actually allies, um, you know, kind of across the spectrum. So peers who are like-minded and, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I feel like it doesn't have to be along racial or ethnic or even gender you know, or sexual orientation. It doesn't have to be along those lines, I think, um, kind of, and I do feel like our trainees are extremely um, open-minded and, and, and wanting progressive change um, across the whole spectrum of EDI. And so, um, so peers, but then also, you know, um, pick carefully. Your <laughs> the people that are you know senior to you that you know would be receptive that may think similarly to you, and then even people in the middle. So administrators can do so much and help you in so many ways. So I think one of the things that I've tried to do is be very strategic about my allies and who um, you know who's like minded and who you know who who can we talk freely about things. That happen even as a reality check, you know, hey, what do you think about this versus, you know, let's band together and, you know, voice our concerns in a letter and everybody signs. So there's not one person or two people that are singled out. Um, I believe it was not this last year, but the year before that, our group of interns, psych interns, um, actually, and so this isn't just in neuropsych, this is kind of our, our general psychology internship class, I mean, something like almost 20 people, um, actually at the end of the year got together um, and wrote a letter to the faculty requesting certain changes in EDI, you know, and with a greater emphasis on um, intersectionality and um, talking about, you know, positions of, of you know, um, power and how to, you know, um, or improving, you know, our cultural sensitivity in terms of supervision. And so it wasn't one person having to bear the full responsibility. It was a collective and it was extremely effective. I mean, we're still talking and still making changes based on that letter. And so I think, you know, I mean, that's, that's certainly one of the things um, that I've tried to do is to kind of be aware of my people, be aware of, of who we can form relationships with 
and and work together to try and bring about some change. And that is, again, you know, I mean, all the way from kind of the very top leadership who they weren't leadership at the time, they were just professors that I worked with or whatever, and they moved up the scale. Um, but now they are resources that we can call on if we need to. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's, you know, probably one of the, the major things that I've done. Um, in addition to all the stuff we, we normally do, right? Work hard, put our heads down, be really, you know, <laughs> the best we can. I mean, all of those things. But I do think that having allies um, has been helpful. I do think that, I mean, in terms of my leadership training, it's actually been along being a woman. Um, so I've been to, I've attended and been nominated for and accepted into several different leadership programs, um, including uh, American Psych Association, um, and then several at the university level. And I'll say, I mean, they're, they've been very helpful because it gives you insight into the way that, you know, admin is thinking as opposed to different perspective, as you, as you noted. And, but, you know, I think, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure my participation in that was as a woman, because many, many of them are centered around women. Again, this idea that, you know, there are URMs and there are, there are programs for women um, to help move people up the ladder. Um, and that doesn't necessarily include Asian American people. And so, um, again, I think, you know, one of the things is advocating for and not allowing this split between minorities. You know, I, I think we all have to work together. And um, so, uh, it's a long answer to your question, but I think I think allies, I think um, being able to work together as a collective, um, even a couple, two or three people is easier than one person by themselves. Please give me as long as an answer as you'd like. <laughs> It's, it's so helpful. And, you know, I, I'm noticing, um, even as I'm listening to you, that it's so easy to put yourself in this mindset that you're isolated, you know, yeah. that you're alone and kind of what you're um, trying to address and respond to. And especially given what you mentioned, that in many settings, um, you know, Asian Americans are very much underrepresented, uh, underrepresented. So it can feel even more just outwardly, you know, that you're alone. Uh, right. so really to, to have, um, such a helpful perspective of, of finding your allies and, um, realizing that, um, there is very much of a corporate and kind of collective, um, initiative that you can join yourself to. Definitely. Uh, so helpful. Um, so, you know, you're, as you're mentioning all these things, I want to ask you, um, this is, uh, you know, for me as an early career neuropsychologist, um, someone that hasn't been, you know, um, had the experiences, you know, that you and your stage um, have, have had, I just love to pick your brain. Um, this can be a lot, you know, um, <laughs> and, you know, what advice do you have um, for early career neuropsychologists, um, especially maybe those that are um, kind of trying to address these kinds of um, issues in their settings, um, but even also just in general in the field, um, what advice do you have for maintaining wellness and avoiding burnout as we progress? That's that is that is a major challenge. I I I know. Um, I I worked through that. Um, yeah, I think you know. I was I was actually um, I had a a two year old when I started on the tenure track at UCLA, and um, it was daunting to think about, you know, so about how to raise my family in the way my son, my son and, and my family as I, in the way that I wanted to, and also do what it took to continue to progress. Um, I think at least for me, I feel like, um, again, being going into it very um, mindfully and intentionally, I prioritized. So, you know, in my mind, I prioritized my family. Um, and um, so, and, and wellness, I mean, and, and my health. Um, and so it's not that I didn't have times in the early days where I would pull the all-nighters or I would work, 
you know, a week at a time with very little sleep to get a grant in or whatever it is. But I did try to, um, at some point early, try to intentionally um, live my life according to my priorities. And in, in my mind, that means, you know, you are, you know, it's time spent, right? What you actually do versus what you think about doing. And so it's hard, but, you know, I would, I schedule, I would schedule um, my workouts. I would schedule time, downtime with my family. Um, I would, now that doesn't mean that when my son went to sleep at night, I, you know, I might work for the rest of the night (laughs) first, you know, depending on what's happening. It's, it's, I mean, I do think that's one of the things, you know, we have the flexibility to schedule to, I was able to maintain my schedule and, and have the flexibility, um, which was incredibly useful for the 10 AM school assembly where, (laughs) you know, where your child's playing the recorder or whatever it is, and you want to be there. Um, but I, but I was able to, um, I, I did that. I scheduled, I, I just thought about how I needed to schedule things to be maximally efficient. So for an example, my advisor, graduate school advisor, mentor said, you know, what you need to do is you need to schedule a couple of hours each day to write. Because, you know, in academia, you either, you have to be writing something all the time. And so, but, you know, two hours, honestly, <laughs> doesn't work for me because I can't settle down. The emails are still coming in. I don't end up getting that much. So I rejiggered it a little bit. And I, you know, now what for me, what I do is I stack my meetings and then I keep days or like half a day open for writing or doing whatever I needed to do. And back in the day, my son is a lot older now. He doesn't need me to schedule time for him in the same way, but, but I did schedule. I mean, I just would schedule it like a meeting that had to be planned around and Um, and I, I felt happy with that. I mean, I definitely made some sacrifices. I didn't travel. Um, I only allowed myself to go to basically one to two conferences per year. Um, you know, going the traveling conferences and, um, and that probably wasn't great for my, you know, visibility as a scholar, but, but it was something I was willing to sacrifice in order to maintain my priorities. And so that that's worked out uh, fairly well for me. Um, so even, yeah, I mean, it, scheduling a workout and, you know, <laughs> like when you have so many other things to do is not that easy or a run or whatever it is. But, you know, my mindset, once I had the exercise was so much better, so much clearer. I was able to focus much better. It, it ended up being the right thing, at least for me. Yeah, that's very helpful even. And I, I'm hearing uh, this term that you used, um, being intentional. Um, and I think sometimes we, you know, just speaking from experience, I'm, you know, fresh out of training, kind of in this early career stage. And I think intentional is not a word that I would commonly use to describe how I'm, you know, approaching um, all the different responsibilities and, and tasks. Um, and so it's it's so helpful to hear how you've um, learned to become so intentional and how you even schedule your time um, for for this uh, to kind of maintain your wellness and, and avoid burnout. Um, I wonder, is there anything you would add for um, you know, especially in this current time for professionals of color that are um, kind of living in these times of social injustice and increased racism? Um, I think it's particularly difficult, you know, to find some of these balances during this kind of time. I agree. I agree. It is um, especially difficult. And with the pandemic as well. I mean, your your home life is your whole life <laughs> until you actually can go out somewhere. Um, I mean, I think it's it doesn't, uh, you know, again, I try to... Um, when I'm scheduling, when I, you know, EDI issues take uh, proportionally more time for me than they used to. And so I do, um, I, I want to do the things that I, I feel can contribute. You know, I personally can make a difference somewhere. And so I will, again, schedule my time. I will be willing to take on opportunities or even jobs 
that um, that I feel like are maybe more work than I need to do, but also something that is worthwhile, right? Has meaning. Um, and so um, I think in these times, I, because anti-racism, I mean, I think we are at this place where, you know, the iron is hot and people are more receptive to hearing about things. And I'm, I'm, I'm exceedingly glad that things, you know, there are actually some actions being put in place, some, you know, at the presidential level, they, you know, he's got some anti-Asian, um, what is it like a, it's part of the DOJ, maybe Department of Justice. Anyway, and then I was just reading about this morning about our attorney, California Attorney General, who is the first Filipino American to um, be in that position. Um, and um, so, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think we have to kind of, it would be really great to keep things moving forward and spending time that doesn't, I mean, so, I mean, it's kind of a different aspect of wellness, right? It's, it's not necessarily your own individual wellness, although contributing to the greater good. And that sort of wellness is also kind of um, how I think about it and how I think about um, structuring my time. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's just really important to also, I mean, you know, for, especially for early career folks, I mean, you know, I know you're working hard, you're working hard to establish yourself, to differentiate yourself, to do all the things that are being asked of you. And I think you also just have to give yourself some permission to enjoy, take a vacation, enjoy life a little bit. It's in the end, you're a better everything person, psychologist, a human, when, you know, you have some balance in your life. And I, I really think it's important. It's, um, so I think that's just another piece. Yeah. Certainly speaking my language there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I need to, I need to, yeah. Um, apply some of this advice right away. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I want to segue a little bit here and just, uh, I think maybe the viewers would like to hear um, a little bit about um, kind of the work you've been doing professionally, um, kind of your clinical interests, um, your research interests. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit more. Yeah, happy to. Um, so, as I said, you know, basically in my postdoc, I started to take on more uh, neuropsych testing. Um, I was already pretty deep into neuroscience. Um, and I really have been working in neuro neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and so I find that both my research and my clinical interests are um, intersecting and um, and form each other. So, um, you know, within our clinic, we see kind of a lot of neurodevelopmental disorders and psychiatric disorders, as well as pediatric neurologic disorders. And so, I tend to, um, I'm pigeonholed as the, the person, I mean, I still see some brain tumor cases and stroke cases, but um, pediatric cases, but I, I tend to see more of the neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and so, you know, I mean, it, regularly in my research, I've incorporated um, neuropsych cognitive measures as well as EEG and brain function measures. And so, um, you know, in early in my career, it was kind of as a, uh, an endophenotype using EEG and cognitive measures, although I found that EEG was much more um, sensitive. Uh, there was less, um, I think, error, measurement error, systematic error in EEG. Um, and so as, as an endophenotype for genetic studies for various neurodevelopmental disorders, so primarily ADHD. Um, and then... Um, so, but you know, I mean, one of the things that I think came out of those studies is just the tremendous heterogeneity, how, you know, the models that we've thought of for so many years in terms of, um, you know, typically developing controls versus your, you know, your, your patient population um, and how they're different. They're so, so, you know, kind of qualitatively different and, um, you know, fast forward 20 years and actually it's all heterogeneity, population level and <laughs> heterogeneity in terms of brain function, in terms of cognitive function. And so I, I, you know, that I bring that into my clinical work because, 
you know, now when we look at measures across, you know, control and patient populations, we recognize there isn't this kind of bimodal distribution. There isn't this complete separation in any measure, really. I mean, there might be some, you know, some very so certain measures of psychosis, maybe, but maybe not even, right? But in terms of kind of all of the typical population level traits that, you know, ADHD, attention, intelligence, reading ability, I mean, all these, you know, all these neuroexecutive functioning measures, there's no straight, you know, differentiation between our two groups. And so, so that really, um, that really informs the way I think about our, our patients and our, you know, in terms of testing batteries, for example. Um, I think it's, it's very easy to kind of follow um, the presenting problem and kind of just go down that rabbit hole. Um, but one of the things I love about neuropsych, even though I do think we probably have to shorten our batteries somewhat and shorten our reports somewhat, <laughs> I do love that we are able to um, design our batteries and be extremely comprehensive just to make sure because things pop up all the time that you might not be expecting. And, and sometimes they're really very important and critical to that person's functioning or at least understanding kind of the whole combination of cognitive behavioral um, and, you know, and educational, you know, pediatric, but functioning or occupational functioning, um, social functioning. I think that's all, I mean, I, I, what I love about neuropsych is just putting, putting the puzzle pieces together. And the fact that we are able to generate as many puzzle pieces as we want, I think is uh, awesome and amazing. Yeah, I certainly agree. It's, it's such an exciting field. And I love how you've, um, taken your research and, um, I've been so thoughtful about you know how you can apply that to your clinical work and um, translating those results to to working with your patients. Um, and I you know the heterogeneity that you speak of you know one aspect um, is the the cultural piece as well, right? Absolutely. And I want to I want to pick your brain here. You know our the way that we you know make diagnoses, the way our DSM has certain criteria. Um, such as a symptom needs to be atypical for a social or educational or family context. Um, you know, this brings about its own set of challenges and yeah. I wonder how you navigate these criteria and what are some important cultural factors you take into consideration uh, when you're making a diagnosis? Um, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, always, uh, you know, again, I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist, so you know, we're always working within the context of the family. So it's, it's so important to understand the, the family situation um, and the cultural background of the family. Um, I think, you know, again, I'm a, I'm a really data-driven person for better or worse. And so, you know, the, to me, the data are the data and, it, and, and, and the, the art is in interpretation and in explaining. And so I find that, you know, if I can, um, the better of a gauge I have of a family culture and context and kind of structure and how that kind of worldview, I can better help them understand um, the results. And it may be what they aren't expecting or what aren't they, what they don't want to hear necessarily, but I, I do... I think, I think symptoms, I mean, I do think there is, you know, there's obviously a lot of subjectivity in certain symptoms. I talk about ADHD, I mean, goodness. Um, and so I do think, I do think there is um, a lot of subjectivity there. You need to have a context to interpret and to understand the behavior and the function of the behavior and then the consequences of the behavior. So understanding, um, you know, and in different settings. So I definitely have seen families where, um, Asian families where, you know, the child is, um, the mom insists that the child has ADHD and other comorbid disorders. And, um, and, um, you know, but the problem is, is that it you know, like doesn't sit still during the piano lesson that the mom is giving him. And he's actually functioning really, really well in school. Teacher sees no problems. So, you know, I mean, you, ha you know, you have to be able to kind of um, understand, explain and think together about not, you know, that doesn't mean you don't 
um, you don't validate what the parent is observing. It's just thinking about maybe different ways to accommodate, different ways to work around the issues that are happening in the family as opposed to at school. You know, um, I think just a very personalized approach to um, every family actually is is really important. And then understanding that, you know, there are cultural contexts where the fit is not great. And, um, you know, just being able to think about that together with the family, I think, seems to be quite helpful. I want to touch on, you know, or explore something that you, you mentioned, you know, the, the context of the family system being being so important, especially in the world of pediatrics. And, um, you know, in an Asian family system, there is certainly a lot of, um, there or can be a lot of stereotype and stigma associated with um, yes. various, you know, disorders or diagnoses. And I wonder how um, you've learned to overcome some of the challenges that you face when even communicating, you know, these diagnoses to the patient's family. Uh, yeah. or learn to navigate them? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, so if they come into our office, they there is a reason. They've, they've shown up at the door. And so, um, you know, what brings you here today? <laughs> why, are, why are we doing this assessment? Is usually, um, I start there. Because, and you know, they may not agree. The parents may not agree with why the school made them come and get this assessment or whatever it is. There is some disconnect. I mean, there's some kind of um, distress there in terms of, you know, they, they've obviously brought their child in, or if you're seeing an adult patient, they've come in for, they've sought some sort of help and, and um, opinion about what's happening. And so being able to, um, to put that into their, to understand, you know, if it, if it's stigma and if it's, um, or, you know, sometimes it's, you know, it's what they grew up with and they don't want to, you know, they, they were always harangued for that or whatever it is. I mean, it's it just, again, understanding what that is. And I, then I try to explain it in a way that is, that takes it out of the responsibility of the family and also the responsibility of, um, or that this is got something that's going to bring shame to the family. Um, you know, um, a lot of times being able to talk about something like, okay, well, this is just how their brain works. And, you know, and so we just want to do what's needed to help their brain work to its maximum potential. Um, I feel like families have a better time understanding it that way than kind of all of the other dynamics and, and, uh, you know, kind of behavioral reasons for what they do, do what they do sort of thing. Um, and, you know, and then kind of coming to a place where we're collaborating versus I'm labeling and telling them their kid needs to do this. Um, understanding what their, um, perspectives are about treatment. You know, many families are extremely resistant to medication and I get it. I, you know, I, I didn't want to put my child on medication, even for kind of, you know, you worry about too many antibiotics, you worry about lots of things, no one wants to put their child on medication. So I understand that. But you know, again, so working to find, to try start with non medication alternatives, if that's what, you know, the family strongly prefers, then okay, we'll start that. And then if it doesn't work, then, you know, you might need to move to something else. But again, kind of collaborating and working for the best possible functioning. And I think that same approach for adults could very well work. And so, you know, I mean, I think one thing in terms of kind of neuropsychology, but then also kind of clinical and research. Um, yeah, I mean, it, my husband asked me an interesting question this morning because he, <laughs> even though we've been married for a long time, he was like, so how does neuropsychology um, you know, what, how does neuropsychology different from psychology? And so I explained it again, but also he was like, and he asked a really great question. He asked, okay, so once you identify a problem with all of the neuropsychology testing, how do you, how, you know, so I'm talking about brain behavior relationships and how, you know, cognitive function is a manifestation of the brain function. And, and he says, well, how do you change the brain? 
can you? And, you know, that's, I think, in terms of research, that is a very similar sort of question that I've been asking for a long time, right? Because we can recommend interventions, we can recommend educational accommodations, but the holy grail is how do you improve brain function? So anyway, we were having this conversation and that's, so in, our, in terms of my most current research, that's what we're doing is trying to um, identify non-invasive neuromodulation sorts of techniques. Um, we were able to actually um, test um, in a randomized control trial the first FDA-approved um, non-invasive neuromodulation treatment, which is called trigeminal nerve stimulation for ADHD. And um, I think it shows great promise. It actually shows great promise for improving executive functions as well. Um, so we'll see. We're going to keep trying to test that. But um, I think I went a little far. I digressed from wherever your question was. But I think I do think it's, um, in the end, we need to collaborate with our families and our patients and, and you know, work towards optimal functioning for them in ways that are acceptable. Yes, well, I very much agree. And I, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm hearing uh, as you were, you know, responding that once again, you're, you're very intentional on in how you communicate with the family, um, you know, what points you choose to emphasize, um, what points um, you choose to kind of focus on, and even for the purpose of building this collaboration that you're that you're mentioning with the family. Um, I also love how your, um, you know, how your research activity has so much informed your clinical practice, and now your clinical practice is informing your research activity. So I'm excited to hear um, what comes in the near future, hopefully, regarding your your uh, your research. Yeah. Um, I want to um, just want to take care of time, but um, kind of want to segue um, to uh, maybe something more uh, bigger picture, which is um, what you know your considerations are about the most important future directions for the specialty of pediatric neuropsychology. You know, what do we need to be addressing in the field today? That's a good question. Um, I mean, it, it might be because I'm in the field, but I, I think pediatric neuropsychology is amazing. And when, I mean, really, honestly, we have the tools to explain behavior and cognition and how that fits together in, in, in the way that a person functions in their environment. I mean, it is a treasure trove of information. And I think that, um, you know, we, we definitely have already carved out certain niche, right? I mean, in terms of pediatric neurology and pre-surgical um, evaluations. Um, I think in terms of, you know, I, it's just such a, I, it's such an important area because we can help people understand their brain and the manifestation of that, their cognition, the way that they think, the way that they learn, the way that they pay they pay attention and and all and the way that they interact with the world. Um, we can we can glean that from our tests and our assessments. We can help people put words to the things that they don't understand about themselves. And, and of course, that's a tool for um, either improving or, you know, sharpening, strengthening the things that they really do like about themselves. And so I think it's really, we have um, a very powerful tool. I think that we need to be better in helping people see the value and also communicating results in a way that people can understand um, so that they benefit from it you know, so that they can hear, they can hear about themselves, they can hear about the way their brain works um, in a way that's digestible, that they can um, use that information. And so um, I think, you know, there's a lot of things that go along with that. So being able to, to talk to um, families, to lay people, and actually, if I'm being honest, I do a lot of um, training for our psychiatry fellows. And they don't actually understand most of what we write in our reports. They they really have no idea, and they're frightened by the fact that these you know really long reports come across their desk, and the patient expects them to understand it and then know what to do based on. So we talk a lot about you know what 
what the tests are, but then how do you approach a neuropsych report, especially a 30 page report, you know, or whatever. And so it's, you know, even I would say in neurology, we, we really, you know, again, we have a very, we have a more simplified battery. We're focused on very focal questions, but I think, um, making our work more accessible, um, both in word and in, in writing. So I do think shorter reports are, you know, we're definitely going in that direction. And then, you know, I think, you know, we have an amazing, um, Hispanic neuropsychology service uh, at UCLA. So Spanish speaking services, you know, services that are more culturally sensitive and appropriate, um, I think is an area that neuropsychology really needs to um, um, grow and to incorporate. And so, you know, within our Asian American communities, I think, you know, even just the understanding for people who aren't Asian American that, you know, Asian American isn't one thing, right? <laughs> so homogeneous, so many different lived experiences. Um, you know, whether you're a second or third generation Asian American versus a fairly new immigrant, or you know, it, the experiences are just completely different. And I don't think, um, I don't think that amount of heterogeneity is appreciated in neuropsychology or psychology, maybe a little bit more in psychology in general, but, <laughs> you know, because there is a cross-cultural psychology area. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, more refinement with respect to, and, you know, and I feel the same way about, for example, African-American families, you know, to say that someone is African-American and feel like you understand what their situation is, is ridiculous. Um, or a Latin family. So I, you know, I think there just has to be more awareness and refinement. And I do think for Asian American communities, the, the, the onus of that falls on us. Like we have to be um, the providers of information um, so that our colleagues who aren't Asian can understand that. You know, you bring up um, such an important point here and, um, I wonder with, with our last question, if we can explore, you know, how can organizations like um, the Asian Neuropsychological Association um, support um, pediatric neuropsychologists, you know, Asian pediatric neuropsychologists and or um, Asian patients? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I, um, I think that, you know, in terms of putting out information and, and you know, educating our neuropsychology colleagues, um, I do, I really do believe, I've, I've heard this so many times that, you know, um, many Caucasian people, not just our psychologists, think of Asian Americans as, as the same as Caucasian. There, there's no differentiation, um, which is so amazing to me in some ways. Um, it really kind of ignores um, the racism and the, and the, the, the history of you know so many Asian American groups, um, and so you know I think producing information and literature is extremely helpful. I think especially in this day and age, you know this anti-racism, anti-Asian American hate um, that I think I think you know it would be welcomed in a lot of places. Um, and so I mean I think that's something that could definitely and you know that's not just pediatric right that's that's a uh, spans the lifespan because, and I, and I think that Asian American, you know, our, our population is growing. We're the fastest, I think, growing demographic percentage wise. So, so, I mean, I think that that's, you know, that's very um, looking towards the future. I think that that's something that's going to be really important and being able to just, and, you know, you, you can just be presented as educational materials, you know, maybe that should be part of continuing ed is thinking about, you know, various minority groups and how you approach um, you approach uh, neuropsych assessment um, in ways that are, you know, kind of more culturally sensitive. Wonderful. Um, I, uh, it even gives me, um, you know, kind of a more uh, perspective and food for thought in terms of um, what uh, initiatives to focus on, um, you know, within an organization like, like ANA. Uh, Everything has been so um, helpful, even personally for me. Um, and uh, 
you know, I just so appreciate, you know, um, the chance to, um, to kind of talk with you over, you know, some of these very important issues that, um, kind of we're facing, you know, personally, um, in our professional lives and, um, even the field as a whole, uh, and how we can do to, to progress. So, um, thank you so much for taking the time today, Dr. Lou. We're so um, glad that you could be here with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, Alex.